Today, the world's shores are under attack. Armies of aliens are secretly invading our coasts. In the Caspian Sea, swarms of ghostly hunters have contributed to the collapse of entire commercial fisheries. In Europe, armoured invaders are rampaging up rivers and threatening local fish stocks. The largest wetland in the world, the Pantanal, is being infiltrated by a silent killer that could destroy this fragile ecosystem. And throughout the world's oceans, huge blooms of toxic algae are contaminating shellfish, causing thousands of deaths. One of the big problems with biological invasions, of course, is that once they established, once the species has invaded, there's virtually nothing you can do about it. One phenomenon is a major cause of this catastrophe. And according to experts, it's threatening the whole marine environment. This is the story of these invasions, why they're happening, and the steps being taken to prevent them. The oceans cover over two-thirds of the world's surface. But the greatest number of marine creatures live in coastal waters. Because here, where sunlight penetrates to the seabed, food and nutrients can be found in abundance. Most of these creatures stay put. Their dispersal discouraged by natural barriers such as land and by changes in water temperature and salinity. So unique coastal ecosystems have formed, where a balance has been established over millions of years. Today, that balance is being drastically changed. And here's the reason why, shipping. This is the Don Quixote, a transoceanic car carrier. She's just left Baltimore and is bound for Zeebrugge in Belgium to load a new consignment of cars. Inside her ballast tanks, she's carrying thousands of tons of seawater drawn from North American harbors. But also inside these tanks are millions of tiny stowaways, all hitching a lift. It's a menagerie of microscopic life forms, mostly invisible to the naked eye. None of these would normally be making this journey. Here at Zeebrugge, as cars are loaded, this water and its stowaways are discharged into a totally foreign environment. And that's when the trouble begins. All ships must carry ballast to keep them steady and level in the water. When unloading cargo, a ship has to maintain its weight on board to stop it rising up and capsizing. And so water is pumped into specially designed tanks. For centuries, ballast came in the form of rocks and sand. But loading solids onto ships was time consuming and expensive. Then came a revolution in ship design. During the 19th century, wooden hulls were replaced by iron and steel. As these hulls were durable and watertight, 
it soon became clear that seawater could replace sand and rock. And in harbours, it's always on tap. But there's something else in harbour waters that no one had considered. Well, one of the very interesting things about marine life is that virtually every form of marine plant and animal has a number of different stages to its life cycle. If we take a limpet, for example, the adult limpet spends its adult stage attached to a hard surface such as a rock. But what we need to remember, of course, is that when this limpet reproduces, it releases its egg and its sperm into the water where they fertilize each other, and the small larval limpets float freely in the water before settling again onto a rock to become an adult limpet. And it is that free floating stage called the plankton that can be taken into a ship's ballast tank. But it's hard to imagine how such tiny creatures like these lobster larvae can survive inside a ship. Well, the vast majority of marine life which is taken into ship's ballast tanks actually do not survive because the conditions inside the ballast tanks are very harsh, usually low oxygen, quite dark, and so therefore during the voyage most of them will die off. But it's the extremely hardy species and the hardy individuals that may survive and it's the fact that they survive which makes them potentially invasive when they get to the other end. At any one time, up to five billion tonnes of ballast water is being carried around the world, transferring over 10,000 different species of marine microbes, plants and animals to distant shores, and with devastating consequences. In Iran, the shores of the Caspian Sea attract hordes of holidaymakers, boosting the local economy. But there's another visitor to the Caspian that's a lot less welcome. Fishermen on these shores have been the main victims of this alien presence. Fishermen like Hassan Yusuf Inijad. He made a good living from these waters for over 30 years. He and his crew catch a local fish called Kilka at night, using lights to attract them into the nets. Fishing here was very good until 1999. We were fishing with 10 to 12 crew members on each boat. And we would catch between 300 kilos and 400 kilos each. We were happy and content with our lives until this unwelcome creature came to the Caspian Sea. This is the creature responsible for Hassan's problems. It's the comb jellyfish. And although it doesn't look too threatening, the locals call it the monster. Its natural habitat is thousands of miles away, in the waters of the Atlantic Ocean off North America. There, its numbers are naturally controlled by other carnivorous jellyfish. But international shipping unintentionally gave the comb jelly a free ride to areas where it has no natural predators. During the 1980s, it showed up in the Black Sea and a few years later in the Caspian Sea. In these waters, already stressed by overfishing and pollution, the population of this alien invader exploded. Oh, 
I think this jellyfish is going to destroy all the Kilka. And not just the stock, it will destroy us. Because our lives are dependent on this fish. We can no longer provide even the bare necessities and our lives are getting worse each day. We are facing poverty, debt. We can't pay the crews, nor even provide for our families. I can't do anything about this creature. I'm totally helpless. Abdul Ghassim Ruhi of the Iranian Fisheries Research Institute has been investigating why the cone jelly has become such a plague. The jellyfish has spread quickly because of the ample food supply in the Caspia. They feed on the zooplankton, which is also the favorite food of the kilka. In fact, the jellyfish is such a voracious predator, it can double its body weight in just 24 hours. And every night, each one reproduces, launching thousands more eggs into the water. It doesn't just eat the food of the local fish, it eats the local fish themselves. They feed on the eggs and larvae of the kilka. So all of these factors have seriously reduced the stock and consequently this has had a terrible effect on the kilka fishing industry. All along the Caspian Sea coastline, fishing is one of the main industries. With the fish fast disappearing, the lives of thousands of people have been affected. Specially built fish meal factories have been abandoned. The shipyards, which maintain the Caspian fishing industry, are falling into disrepair and the Iranian fishing fleet is slowly disintegrating. For men like Hassan, with a young family to bring up, the future looks very uncertain. My only worry is the future livelihood of my children. As a father, I should provide for them. They will need food and clothes, but also an education. I should give them these things, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to or not. Stories like these are unfolding all over the world, and they are not confined to the people and animals living by the coast. Belém Novo is a small village on the edge of Lake Guaiba in southern Brazil. This too used to be a thriving fishing community. Two years ago, I used to catch 500 kilo, 1,000 kilo of fish. I used to sell it. Today, I don't even have fish to eat at home. The cause of the problem is another tiny creature that again seems almost insignificant. This is the golden mussel. The golden mussel's natural home is in the rivers of China and Southeast Asia. In the early 90s, it was carried in ship's ballast water to the estuary of the Rio Plata in Argentina. Here, with no predators to keep it in check, this freshwater mussel thrived. This is a busy port with ships passing to and fro around the continent.
Now the banks of the rivers are littered with millions of foul-smelling, razor-sharp mussel shells. But it's the golden mussel's astonishing ability to reproduce that's impacting on areas other than fishing. This water supply station has recently seen its maintenance costs triple. Two years ago, servicing took place twice a year. Now this pump has to be lifted every month. Because over 700,000 mussels are packed into every square meter of its surface. The impact of this tiny pest grows ever wider. As it moves further and further inland, it's affecting the very infrastructure of the country. This is one of the biggest hydroelectric dams in Brazil, supplying 10% of the energy generated in the whole country. In 2002, the mussel was discovered for the first time in its reservoir. Not long after, it was spotted by maintenance workers overhauling the system. And around the world, human health is also being affected by the onslaught of these invasions. Just off the coast of South Africa, what looks like a huge red stain on the surface of the water is actually a mass of living organisms. This is a red tide, a bloom of tiny microscopic algae called dinoflagellates. This phenomenon occurs naturally when changing currents disrupt the nutrient cycle of coastal waters. They can accumulate at the surface of the water and these blooms can then decay and that decay process results in, in, in low oxygen water. And so we can then have extensive mortalities which include these rock lobster mortalities that we see on our coast. It causes mass die-offs of some marine creatures by attacking their nervous system. I started off in the morning, it was a beautiful day, I decided to go down to the beach and it was a bit spontaneous rather than a planned event. It suddenly decided, hey, the tide's low, let's, let's grab some mussels. The most severe type of uh, uh, red tide poisoning is the paralytic shellfish poisoning, by far. So we go ahead and we pick our mussels, brought them home, cooked them up and uh, ended up having a great feast lunch outside on the terrace, mussels. And later in the afternoon, suddenly it kind of, it was a sort of a gradual thing, it, it, it sort of, I suppose, a tingling uh, sensation came to my fingers and extremities. Uh, symptoms usually start about one to two hours after a meal. Didn't think too much of it. And most of the time, the patients don't realize that they've got food poisoning. I thought, okay, well, Jean got onto the phone to her GP, GP said, look, it does sound like a bit of muscle poisoning. It can't be that serious. Take a bit of antihistamine and I'm sure it will go away. Breathing can stop within about two to 24 hours after ingestion, depending obviously on the dose. In the meantime, the sensation has actually now increased very substantially. It's up my legs, it's my arms. I'm getting this numbness all over. It's, in fact, it's a very strange kind of feeling. You felt as one wasn't walking on the ground any longer. It's like somebody who's drunk. Willem's wife, Jean, was really panicking and phoned the poison control unit. And they said, whew, no, no, you've got to go to hospital. So, oh, come, 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 now, let's now not make a big issue of it. And we've had a case, for instance, where um, husband and wife, they had a meal uh, of uh, shellfish in the evening and they went to bed and the, the husband woke up during the night and he was feeling ill and then he discovered that his wife was dead beside him on the bed. Willem was rushed to hospital and carefully monitored. It was alarming to think what would have happened if we would have stopped breathing and, you know, 
sequence so it's only realizing how quickly these things do just creep up on you you know you could have died there in the night uh, but and, and, and just quietly in your sleep willem otten was lucky to survive but paralytic shellfish poisoning is on the increase and ballast water is partly responsible but shipping also brings tremendous benefits to modern society. Transporting 90% of world trade it provides a service on which the global economy and its future depends. But there is hope. Action is being taken. And it starts here in London, at the offices of the International Maritime Organization. IMO is an agency of the United Nations, and part of its responsibility is the protection of the marine environment from shipping activities. IMO has taken a number of initiatives, uh, together with its member states, the shipping industry, as well as non-governmental -govern organizations. That's led to the development of a 